This video is the second of four which discusses how to design a house to be as flood resistant as possible. Part two focuses on the risks of flooding and how best to plan a flood response. Hi, I'm Daniel of Daniel Clark Architect. This is part two of my mini series on designing a house to be as flood proof as possible. In this part two video, I'm going to list the range of risks that flooding poses to you and start to look at the different measures that a community and household can take to best be prepared for a flood emergency. So the first risk, no matter the cause for a flood, the drainage system around your foundations will become overloaded. That water in the soil is pressing sideways on your foundation walls or on your basement walls and those foundations those basement walls were not generally designed to take that sideways pressure as a result the walls might start to crack possibly buckle and then even collapse the collapse of the foundation then leads to the collapse of the entire structure an associated risk with waterlogged soil as the water's moving through the soil it starts to undermine the foundations it pulls away the earth from underneath foundations underneath utilities and even under roadways if the foundations are undermined, they will collapse, the whole building collapses. Utilities, for example, gas lines, they have these supports that are designed to hold the pipes in place. If those supports are undermined and washed away, the gas lines could deflect, rupture, explode, and possibly lead to fire. That's why you see a lot of fires, those are gas lines after an earthquake. Also, as we saw in November of 2021 here in BC, the ground underneath the roadway can be washed away and that will lead to the collapse collapse of portions of the road. The danger of that roadway collapsing is the supply lines, critical supplies don't get through. Emergency services are then cut off as well, so people who need critical care aren't able to get it. Buried electrical lines can also become exposed, and once that water hits those exposed lines, then there's an automatic electrocution hazard. If the water lines get into a house and reach the electrical equipment, again you have an electrocution hazard. Water that finds its way into the house if it reaches equipment, that equipment is very expensive to replace. The whole systems have to be replaced. The flood water can carry large debris. Trees, cars, pieces of bridges, even boats are one of the biggest hazards. They can damage buildings. They can destroy buildings as they batter them. They can sweep away the people and cause them to drown. As water infiltrates, water treatment plants, sanitary sewers, chemical processing, or storage plants, that water then becomes highly contaminated contaminated and spreads toxic chemicals and diseases. People who aren't lucky enough to find safe ground may die from hypothermia. If they're wounded, that open wound can become infected and possibly even to subsequent death. There's a possibility of people just drowning. Since a flood impacts an entire community, the entire community needs to establish a plan. The best response to an emergency is any response that has a plan. The community needs to come together to educate itself on the risks and on its collective resources. The community members should designate a place to gather, to collect resources for people who really need them, and also to establish who's going to be checking up on the more vulnerable. This will help speed up the flow of information when communication lines will be likely down. Households in a similar fashion should plan somewhere to gather, maybe a family member or family household to which to assemble and that'll help them communicate when the networks are probably out of service. A household should have some means of sanitary handling. You're not going to have a working toilet in all likelihood. There are specially lined refuse bags and you grab a five gallon pail to handle that. You should also have several days worth of clean drinking water because likely the city's drinking water supply is going to be contaminated. If you're able to have an emergency generator at a safe elevation or possibly an uninterrupted power supply, a UPS or other battery, battery-based system to give you battery power for critical devices or possibly even a nominal amount of heat where necessary. Let's summarize the discussion of a flood-resistant house. There are numerous risks, such as collapsed buildings and utilities, hidden floating debris, hypothermia and drowning hazard, disease and toxic chemicals in the flood water. However, communities and households can plan ahead. Communities might plan to assemble, share resources, and assign responsibilities. Households should ensure a supply of clean drinking water and backup power and optionally prepare an inflatable kayak. 
In part three, I'll start to look at the different adjustments to make to your landscaping, to the area around your house, and to the house itself to best help you keep the water from getting into the house. If you can't wait and would rather discuss these strategies directly with me on your next project, feel free to get in touch by booking a project consultation call from my website.